All right, so it looks like we've got a pretty good group together. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so just for introductions, I'm Chase and Croft. I'm the uh, trauma medical director and associate professor of surgery at the University of Florida. Um, I've been doing diaphragm pacing since 2011. And today we're going to talk about diaphragmatic pacing from Superman to COVID. I know this is a uh, sort of a mixed bag of, of specialties. I think we have maybe some surgeons, some nurses, some respiratory therapists. Um, so I, I really try to make this talk uh, fairly broad, but I will be happy to answer any questions um, at the end. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the um, chat function and, uh, and I'll try to get to those as, as soon as I see them pop up. With that, we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, the only disclosure I have is that I am a proctor for Synapse Biomedical. Uh, so I train other uh, surgeons and facilities how to use uh, these devices. We will be discussing the uses of uh, FDA approved devices, the Synapse Medical uh, NeuroRx DPS system and the Synapse Biomedical trans system, which I'll just sort of briefly touch on towards the end. So uh, these are the objectives that I hope to uh, uh, shoot upon. So for those of you that don't know, the image on the right of the screen, that's the SR-71 Blackbird. So it's a military plane. It actually holds the world's record for the highest uh, vertical altitude at like 85,000 feet and the fastest uh, speed in an airplane at Mach 3.3, which is almost uh, 2,200 miles an hour. So I, I put that picture in because this is going to be a, a very high, uh, fast-paced overview of diaphragmatic pacing. Um, I hope to uh, discuss the pathological states predisposing to diaphragm dysfunction. We're going to talk about how to identify appropriate candidates for diaphragmatic pacing, discuss uh, the actual implantation technique, differentiate between the different pacer types, that's the permanent pacer system, the NeuroRx system, and the trans system, and then briefly touch upon um, how to interpret diaphragmatic pacer malfunctions. So again, I know we have a mixed bag, so uh, I wanted to go over a little bit of anatomy. So really, before we can um, talk about pacing, uh, give me one second, I'm gonna move this screen here. Um, so really, before we talk about diaphragmatic pacing, we really have to first understand how the diaphragm works. So when we talk about respiratory innervation, what we're really talking about is breathing. And often this is described uh, as two main types. So you have quiet breathing when we're at rest, and then you have forced breathing when we're exerting ourselves. Uh, the diaphragm and the external intercostals are really the prime movers of quiet inspiration. But as demand increases uh, during exercise, for example, the accessory muscles come into play. And these include the sternocleidomastoids, the scalenes, and the, the trapezius muscles. Expiration, on the other hand, is really more of a passive process under normal breathing. However, during times of forced expiration, the expiratory muscles are recruited, and this includes the uh, internal intercostals, the rectus abdominis, and the abdominal obliques. So we, we all know that the diaphragm is shaped like a dome. You've got uh, this centrally located um, inner aspect, which is the um, tendon. And then you've got the zone of apposition, which is lateral, which is directly opposed to the inner aspect of the lower ribs. The apposition zone constitutes about 30% of the total surface area of the rib cage. And during inspiration, as the muscle fibers shorten, the opposed area decreases and the dome descends uh, axially. This increases the intrathoracic cavity and displaces the uh, abdominal contents uh, caudally. So the diaphragm itself is controlled by uh, the phrenic nerve. The nerve originates from the uh, phrenic motor nucleus of the ventral horn of the spinal cord. And we can see that the uh, branches of the phrenic nerve uh, primarily come off of the uh, C4 uh, nerve root, uh, which you can see right here, but we also have some smaller branches that come off of C3 and C5, and that's where we get that mnemonic 345 keeps the diaphragm alive. As the main trunk descends uh, down the neck, it, it goes down uh, posterior to the subclavian veins, 
It goes laterally along the pericardium and eventually it branches within the hemidiaphragm. Generally, this branching follows the course of the phrenic vessels, which we can see um, during Dr. Mag's uh, pacer implantation. And I'm going to show you a video of that here in just a little bit. So that's kind of basic nerve anatomy. Let's talk about, uh, about diaphragm dysfunction. And diaphragm dysfunction can really be divided into three main categories. The first is eventration, which is the, the permanent elevation of all or part of the diaphragm. This generally occurs on one side of the diaphragm and is often seen as an elevated hemidiaphragm on chest x-ray. Uh, this can be caused by many things. You can have tumors um, at the apex of the lung. You can have thoracic surgery, cardiac ablation for atrial fibrillation, or any other trauma to the phrenic nerves. Um, but really, the most common etiology of eventration is just idiopathic, and you don't really know why it happens. I get lots of consults for this. Uh, most patients that are referred to me are completely asymptomatic. It was just an incidental finding on chest x-ray and, and somebody got worked up and sent them to me for diaphragmatic pacing. Um, but I, I do have a fair amount of patients who are relatively symptomatic. And those are usually patients who are either musicians, you know, for instance, they play a wind instrument, um, or they have very active lifestyles. They like to play sports, they play golf, or um, they uh, do a lot of strenuous activities for work. Uh, another category of diaphragm weakness, uh, or which is actually diaphragm weakness, is actually the, the partial loss of muscle strength, and you're unable to generate the necessary pressure for adequate ventilation. Now, probably the most common scenario where we see this is in the ICU, uh, and this is uh, often manifest as failure to wean from the ventilator or failure to tolerate uh, spontaneous breathing trials. And then finally, the other uh, category uh, is complete paralysis. And obviously, the most common cause of that is going to be trauma and high spinal cord injuries. But both diaphragm weakness and paralysis, it can be unilateral, it can be bilateral, it can be temporary, permanent. It really just depends on the, the uh, underlying cause. So when we talk about causes of diaphragm dysfunction, we literally could talk about uh, this topic for hours. I mean, there's literally hundreds of different etiologies. Um, you can see on the screen, um, that's just a, a smattering of the most common ones. Um, problems include uh, issues in the brain itself from things like strokes. It can be caused from issues in the ventral horns of the spine, such as uh, transverse myelitis or it can be issues in the actual terminal muscles themselves uh, in the actual diaphragm. But really for the, the purpose of this talk, I'm really gonna focus just on diaphragm paralysis due to trauma um, and issues related to mechanical ventilation. So when someone has diaphragm dysfunction, how do they present clinically? Well, usually we're gonna see uh, that the patient develops hypoxia, their oxygen saturations are gonna be low, they may have decreased breath sounds or atelectasis in the lower portions of the lung. You, know, you may notice rapid shallow respirations um, and potentially paradoxical movement of the abdominal wall as they're trying to use that abdominal wall musculature to breathe. I mentioned earlier that most breathing is controlled by um, actual diaphragm contraction. But when this ability is disrupted, uh, inspiration is still able to be maintained with the use of our accessory muscles. And again, that's primarily the sternocleidomastoids, the scalenes, and the intercostals. And these are all indicators that we can see in patients who have diaphragm weakness. You can actually see the muscles in the neck start to bulge. You can see the muscles in between the ribs start to bulge as they're starting to use more and more of these uh, accessory muscles to breathe. And because of this, patients often begin to panic, uh, particularly when they're lying supine because it's really much more difficult to breathe with your accessory muscles when you're in the supine position, um, mainly because gravity is, is playing a role. And then ultimately breathing can't be sustained for long periods of time with the use of accessory muscles. Our accessory muscles were not designed for prolonged breathing and they're actually relatively fast acting muscles. And so uh, we're gonna get to this later, but if you can imagine a sprinter versus a marathon run. And so ultimately these patients uh, fail uh, to breathe spontaneously and then they're gonna need some support, whether that be with uh, non-invasive ventilation or mechanical ventilation. 
And when we talk about patients with high spinal cord injuries, they have uh, potentially disrupted the innervation to these accessory muscles as well. So they can't even use their sternocleidomastoids or their intercostals. These muscles then become flaccid and this allows the chest wall to depress and this further depresses their functional capacity. And then when you combine this with uh, flaccid abdominal muscles because of paralysis, they simply can't generate the necessary negative inspiratory force to inhale. But because the muscles are flaccid, they also lose that passive expiratory ability. So the muscles don't snap back, if you will, when they go to exhale. And so they can't completely exhale. That's when you start seeing breast stacking um, on the ventilator. And ultimately, they're going to require some, some form of rapid mechanical ventilatory assistance. Otherwise, they're, they're ultimately going to die of respiratory arrest. So we quickly place these patients on the vent, but as we all know, mechanical ventilation really is a double-edged sword. While it's a life-saving form of supportive therapy, we also know that it causes significant disuse atrophy and, and actual structural changes in the diaphragm itself. Multiple in vivo studies have shown significant reductions in the generation of both active and passive myofibrillar force by reducing myofibrillar protein levels. And this is really what forms the lattice work of the diaphragm. In addition, muscle atrophy occurs due to increased uh, muscle proteolysis and um, reduction of protein synthesis. So again, now we've got not only a decrease in uh, the fibers within that lattice, but we're actually losing the lattice itself. So if you remember, the diaphragm is primarily a slow oxidative type one muscle fiber. So this is a, a slow acting fatigue resistant uh, type of muscle. So again, if you can imagine a marathon one. However, the longer that you're on mechanical ventilation, um, that muscle fiber converts um, and you get these architectural changes in, in which the, the muscle fiber converts to a fast twitch, glycolytic, easily fatigable type 2B muscle. So if you can imagine a sprinter, you know, if you take a sprinter and you try to put them in the box of marathon, they're going to fail within the first, you know, 100, 200 meters um, because they're just not used to that endurance. The same thing happens with the diaphragm. And if we allow this to go unabated, the diaphragm subsequently completely atrophies. And unlike other skeletal muscles, say if we, if we uh, put ourselves in a bed for a month, we lose the muscle strength in our arms or our legs. We notice that we look connected. But then we could get up with physical therapy, we could get to the gym, we could work out and we could build that muscle back. Well, unfortunately, the same thing doesn't happen in the diaphragm. Once the muscle in the diaphragm atrophies, it no longer comes back. So we can't then exercise that muscle and get it back. So that's what we're trying to prevent. Um, and this is something you can actually see in the operating room. The, the diaphragm will actually look paper thin. You can actually see the lung sliding um, behind the diaphragm, that's usually a, a bad indicator that they're not going to be able to uh, pace. So this is probably the, the single landmark study that really proved this theory. Uh, Levine et al. published these results in the New England Journal back in 2008, and it's really a fascinating study. They, they compared the diaphragm biopsy specimens from 14 uh, brain-dead organ donors uh, prior to donation, and these were the case subjects. Um, they then compared those to eight patients who are undergoing thoracic surgery for either benign lesions or small isolated lung cancers, and these were the controls. And what they found was that all case subjects um, uh, were on the vent for 16 to, or excuse me, 18 to 69 hours prior to biopsy, and the controls or the uh, uh, patients who are undergoing thoracic surgery were on the vent for two to three hours prior to biopsy. And as compared to the diaphragm biopsy specimens from controls, the specimens from the case subjects actually show decreased cross-sectional areas of, of both slow twitch muscle fibers as well as fast twitch muscle fibers of 57% and 53%. They also had decreased glutathione concentration of 23%, and this is a known indicator of oxidative stress. The case subjects also had increased uh, cat phase three activity, uh, of 100%, as well as um, uh, a decrease in the proteins of the myofibrillar lattice, which is an important step in uh, proteolysis, uh, excuse me, proteolysis. There's also a 200% increase in uh, atrogen-1 messenger RNA, 
uh, which is a transcript to MBD4, which is a housekeeping gene within the diaphragm itself, and a 590% higher ratio of the MRF1 mRNA transcripts, again, to MB, MBD4. Um, and both of these are important pathways in proteolysis. So we have decreased generation of, of uh, protein and muscle fibers, and we have increased breakdown of that muscle fibers. So their conclusion was a combination of complete diaphragm uh, inactivity as well as mechanical ventilation results in marked atrophy of uh, the diaphragm myofibers and increased proteolysis uh, during diaphragm inactivity. And we all know that this disuse atrophy begins almost as soon as somebody is on a ventilator. Um, and most of us have probably seen this, again, manifest as failure to wean a spontaneous ventilation or spontaneous breathing trials. So this really begs the question, what can we do to prevent this? And so at about the same time that this body of literature was coming out, um, uh, Dr. Anders was at work with Synapse Biomedical in collaboration with Case Western Reserve, as well as the University of Hospitals in Cleveland, in creating the NeuroRx diaphragmatic pacing system. Um, this is a, a four-channel battery-powered neurostimulator in, uh, implanted with four electrodes, two on either side. It provides uh, electrical stimulation to the muscle and nerves of the diaphragm. And it first received FDA approval for dependency uh, from the ventilator for spinal cord injuries in 2008. So um, what other workup um, is needed? So uh, I'm gonna preface this by saying that patients with acute spinal cord injury uh, who come in immediately after their trauma really don't need any workup. Um, you can just take them immediately to the operating room and uh, trial implantation. However, uh, you may get patients, like I get patients all the time who get referred to me who have been at another institution, they've been on the ventilator for weeks, potentially even months before they get to me. And in those patients, they really uh, should undergo a fluoroscopic sniff test. This is also known as diagnostic fluoroscopy. It's really a, a quick and easy real-time fluoroscopic assessment of the diaphragm motor function. Uh, it's used most often to confirm the absence of muscular contraction of the diaphragm during inspiration in patients with uh, phrenic nerve palsy. The technique is really fairly straightforward. Um, you take the patient down to fluoro, you ask them to practice some sniffing before the study. Ideally, you like the patient in um, uh, the uh, standing position. Obviously, if we're talking about a, a spinal cord injury patient, they won't be able to do that, but you potentially can, can sit them up. Um, but again, if this is an acute spinal cord, you can put them supine and that will suffice. Uh, the radiologist then performs a frontal fluoroscopy of the diaphragm, both at rest, um, quietly breathing through an open mouth, and again, if not intubated, we're gonna ask the patient to take a few rapid, quick breaths with a closed mouth, sort of stimulating a sniff, if you will, hence, hence the name, uh, and causing rapid inspiration. A positive test is indicated if uh, you don't see the diaphragm um, moving downwards uh, during inspiration. And occasionally you'll actually see a paradoxical movement where one side of the diaphragm actually moves up uh, with inspiration. Um, the other test, which has been um, talked about in the literature, but really is not routinely performed, is the phrenic nerve EMG. Um, technically, it's a really difficult test to perform. It's very difficult to um, identify the phrenic nerves, either doing it through the neck or through an intercostal space. You really need a skilled neurologist to do it. I've been doing uh, uh, this procedure for about 11 years now. In all my years, I've only seen one patient who ever underwent uh, a phrenic nerve EMG. So it's, it's really rarely uh, performed. And the primary test that we're gonna do is the fluoroscopic sniff test. So uh, if you would have noticed at the title of the talk, it was diaphragm pacing from Superman to COVID. Um, the reason that I chose Superman is because for those of us who are old enough to remember the original Superman, it was Christopher Reeves. Um, and he injured himself during a uh, horse riding event where he fell off the horse and his legs got caught in the reins and he, he broke his neck. Uh, he actually was one of the first patients that was implanted with the NeuroRx uh, DPS system. And actually you can see uh, in the picture in the bottom here, 
Um, this is uh, Dr. Anders right here. Here's Christopher Reeves, and they're discussing uh, their experience with uh, implantation. Our first uh, experience at the University of Florida began in 2009. Um, here you can see Dr. Larry Lautenberg. He was one of my partners when I started performing uh, the first procedure at the University of Florida. Uh, Dr. Lautenberg actually trained me when I was a junior faculty member uh, back in 2011. The patient that you actually see him operating on uh, was a 20-year-old gentleman who sustained a high C-spine injury after uh, an assault. Uh, he was implanted by Dr. Lautenberg way back in 2009, and he's still a patient of mine. He's fully paced. Um, he's able to do his, his activities of daily, daily living, and he lives at home um, and just occasionally uses the ventilator as backup if he gets uh, a pneumonia. Uh, I have had to re-implant him uh, at least two times uh, in, his, in his life with the DPS system, but um, this is just proof that, that it does work and it is designed to stay in for life. All right, so now let's really get into the meat and potatoes of how we implant. So I'm, I'm gonna show you an actual patient of mine. This was a 65 year old gentleman who sustained a ground level fall back in January of 2000, uh, 2021, excuse me. He fractured his neck and had a uh, C3 to C6 uh, cord compression. He had uh, uh, multiple discs that uh, were impinging on his cord, and he went, underwent an emergent uh, decompression at an outside hospital the day after his trauma. Uh, unfortunately, after his surgery, he failed to wean from the vent. He would not tolerate any spontaneous breathing trials, and that's when they uh, consulted with, with me, and ultimately, he was sent to our facility uh, the following month. So approximately one month after his injury, he gets to me, uh, we uh, immediately evaluated him, uh, decided that he was going to be a good candidate for PACER, and took him to the operating room approximately three days after arriving. Uh, we were able to successfully implant. I'm going to show you some videos of that in just a second. And ultimately, uh, just about a week after implantation, he was transferred to an LTAC. He was tolerating ATC trials and fully paced. All right, so this is... Um, uh, where I typically place my incisions. Um, so I typically use a uh, Hassan technique to get in at the umbilicus. So I'll use a uh, 12 Hassan trocar at the umbilicus. I'll put two five millimeter working ports in the upper quadrants. And then I'll put a 12 millimeter step, tro step trocar in the subxiphoid location. Now, as you can see, this patient had already undergone a peg. That's not a big deal. We just work around the peg. So typically, this left upper quadrant port, I'll usually place a little more laterally if they haven't had a peg placed. Uh, but in this case, I just work around the peg. So I put in a little bit more medial uh, in, in this patient. So this is how I actually place the leads. So the first step is we do a diagnostic laparoscopy, and we look at both hemidiaphragms. And you can tell relatively quickly if somebody is going to pace or not pace. If they have severe atrophy, like I mentioned earlier, you'll notice that the diaphragm looks like a sheet of paper, and you can see lung sliding behind it. I'll still go ahead and try to stimulate the diaphragm in that case with the uh, expectation that it's probably not going to stimulate. But in a good, healthy patient who is fresh out of the trauma, you'll see robust muscle fibers coming across a nice, uh, healthy diaphragm. Um, and so this is the, the very first thing we do is we just look anatomically at both sides of the diaphragm. Now, we always start on the left uh, hemidiaphragm just because this is the more difficult side to work with. You've got the pericardium right there. You've got the stomach and the spleen, which is typically in your way. Um, so we usually start on that side. So we place a patient in a really steep uh, reverse Trendelenburg position always make sure that they have a foot forward in place so that they don't slide down the bed. And then we airplane them with the left side up. Now the video I'm gonna show you is actually uh, showing you the right side, but the technique is the same. Just instead on the right side, we airplane uh, with the right side up. So using the clinical station, which is uh, this little computer down here, this is the actual pacer box, and I'll show you more about that later. But this is the clinical station, and this is how we're going to map our phrenic nerves. 
Um, and this is how we're going to program the box. So using the clinical stations, we're going to apply a stimulus to the areas around those phrenic nerve branches. And in general, they course right along the uh, phrenic vessels. So you can actually see in the picture, you can see the phrenic vessels here. So usually the anterior branch of the phrenic nerve is going to be somewhere in here, and the posterior branch is usually going to be somewhere right around this Y point. So once I've identified my point of maximum stimulation, so we're going we're gonna to use a Maryland dissector, we're going to touch where we think the phrenic nerve branches are, and we're going to apply a stimulus, and then we're going to see um, the diaphragm contract. So this is what we're going to see right now in the video. So this is actually the posterior uh, branch. So there's the stimulus. You see the muscle contract. Now we're going to touch the anterior branch. And again, you see the diaphragm contract. So once we've identified our points of maximum stimulation, we're going to go ahead and mark those locations. So I'll just take the Maryland dissector. I'll grab a little piece of diaphragm tissue. And I'll give it a little twist. It causes a little bruise to the muscle. It doesn't have any long-term effects, but now we know where we're going to implant. So now after we made the decision to proceed, so we're going to do that on both left and right sides. As long as we see both sides uh, contract with the stimulus, we're going to proceed to implantation. So now I usually take down the falciform ligament. So I'll use a ligature uh, device to just take the falciform down. You don't have to go all the way uh, up the dome of the liver, but just take enough that you can get uh, your trocar in the subdiphoid location. I use a step trocar so that I, I, I don't have to go back and close that, that fascial incision. Um, uh, it's my personal experience that once I place the step trocar, that's where we're gonna, we're gonna put our delivery device. And I'll, uh, I'll show you that here in this video. But typically, um, once I put the delivery device in, I'm gonna be standing on the contralateral side to the side that I'm working on. So for instance, in this case, you're going to see me putting the, the leads in the right kidney diaphragm, so I'm standing on the patient's left side. Again, that's just personal preference. You may find uh, with your experience that you like doing it the other way. Um, so what you'll see me do is I'm putting the delivery device in, which is essentially a big hollow board needle. The actual pacer lead gets loaded into the device through the hollow board needle. The wire itself has a little um, barb at the end of it, which captures into the diaphragm. And it's got a little pieces, uh, a few little pieces of blue nylon strand to help you identify the end of the lead. So you'll see me introduce the uh, lead through the diaphragm. Um, and then you'll see my first assist, who's a junior resident, attempt to grasp uh, the end of, of that lead. And forgive him, he's a junior resident, so he doesn't have a whole lot of experience. He's a little bit clumsy. Um, but you'll see him go in with a Maryland dissector and grab the little end. You can see the, the piece sticking out. That's the um, um, barb that I was referring to right here. And then you see the little blue nylon strands at the end of it. So now after a couple of attempts, he's going to grab it. And then once he grabs it, I'm going to straighten that needle out and I'm going to pull the whole delivery device back out of the abdomen, leaving the wire in place. He's going to hold the wire as I'm pulling the needle out. Um, and we'll see right here in the next video. So now I've placed the lead. Um, and I'm applying a stimulus and you see the diaphragm contract. So again, this is the posterior portion of the right hemi diaphragm. And then now you're gonna see me uh, placing the anterior lead in the right hemi diaphragm. And in this video, I'm gonna use a little bit different technique. Instead of having my first assist grab that barb at the end of it, I'm just gonna directly insert the, the uh, delivery device and needle straight through and through a portion of the diaphragm. And then you'll see as they pull the needle out, that barb catches in the diaphragm and holds the uh, lead in place without the need to, to grab the other end. Either technique is totally acceptable and it's really purely uh, preference. So you see holding the lead as I'm pulling the delivery device out to make sure that I don't accidentally pull the wire out of the diaphragm. Now, occasionally, uh, you can't get uh, the needle to go through and through a piece of diaphragm. That's okay. 
you just insert the needle into the diaphragm and you close the delivery device just a little bit and it'll tint the diaphragm. And then you can have a, a first assist grab uh, the uh, bridge of tissue over top of your needle as you pull the needle out. And again, the barb is going to capture in the muscle of the diaphragm and hold that wire in place as you're pulling the delivery device out. So once we place uh, all four leads, we're then going to test. Um, all of them together. And we want to make sure that we see both lobes of the diaphragm contract. And we want to make sure um, to ask our anesthesiologist to make sure that we're not seeing any ectopy on the monitor. So here you're going to see us testing all four leads. There's the stimulus on the right. There you see the stimulus on the left. Now you can tell in this patient, his left hemidiaphragm is much weaker than his right hemidiaphragm. But over time, as you start to rehab that diaphragm, which is really what the pacing system does, it's, it's PT for the diaphragm, we'll, we'll convert those muscle fibers from that 2B type muscle fiber back to that slow twitch type 1 fiber and strengthen that diaphragm back up. And ultimately, you'll see that diaphragm function normally. So uh, once we're assured that all four leads are functioning appropriately, we'll take the subdiphoid trocar out um, and uh, pull all four leads out of the abdomen. I typically place a 2 uh, silk along the left leads um, just so that I know what leads are left and what leads are right. What leads are anterior and posterior doesn't matter, but we do need to know what's left and what's right, and that's going to be important for the next phase, which is the, the tunneling phase. Um, so I, I just wanted to show you uh, that the complications do occur in this procedure. It's pretty rare. I always tell my patients the, the major complications, obviously bleeding because we deal with the liver, the spleen, the stomach, all right underneath the, the diaphragm. We can injure the other structures in the abdomen. All of the complications associated with, with anesthesia um, and laparoscopy, such as hernia, but really probably the highest risk complication is development of the capnothorax. Um, this occurs in about 20% of patients. I'm gonna show you another video of a patient that I did earlier this week. Um, the uh, lead implantation went relatively straightforward. It was one shot. You can see I go in, I don't grab a big uh, piece of tissue. Um, I secure the wire in place. Now you're going to see me test the wire. You're going to see the diaphragm contract. And then immediately after, you're going to see that diaphragm bulge down. So if you give it one second, so I'm pulling the instrument out. There's the stimulus and there's the bulge in the diaphragm. So that's a capnothorax. Um, again, it occurs right here is the bulge that I'm re referring to. It occurs in about 20% of patients. Uh, most of the time, you don't have to do anything. You may notice a little bit of hypoxia decrease in your pulse ox um, immediately when it happens. But typically, what I'll do is I'll ask my anesthesiologist to give them a couple of valsalva maneuvers, give them a couple of big breaths and hold it, and that capnothorax will get absorbed. So remember, we're using CO2 gas for insufflation, and because we're using a hollow board needle to implant the wire into the diaphragm, sometimes that uh, CO2 gas can either get through the hole in the diaphragm that we're making or it can actually go through the hollow bore needle um, and cause a cap um, Occasionally, uh, you have to do a needle decompression um, and that usually resolves. Again, that happens uh, or that's required in about 10 to 20 percent of patients of the patients that get a cap uh, And so for that reason, I'll usually make sure that I prep out the lower portion of both chests just in case somebody doesn't tolerate the cabinet thorax, I can just stick a little spinal needle in there, suck it out, uh, and that resolves the issue. Uh, so this is what it looks like um, after we pull the wires out. So again, um, this is our uh, excuse me, let me get my up. This is our subdiphoid trocar side. I pulled all four wires out. And then we use tunnelers, which come within the kit. So there's four uh, tunnelers, and then there's a short fifth tunneler, which uh, is for the ground lead. So we tunnel these through the subcutaneous tissues, and we bring them out through the right mid-abdomen. 
We then irrigate these uh, essentially big hollow board needles to make sure that we get any uh, little fat globules which may accumulate in the needle. We get those out and then we thread the uh, wires through these uh, needles so that we can tunnel them through the sub -Q. So the, uh, I mentioned that I, I usually mark the left side wires and that's because the left side wires always go through the top two needles. So those two go in first, followed by the right side wires. And then lastly is um, the ground lead, which just tunnels in the subcutaneous tissue. So once those are tunneled, I'll then um, take out my remaining trocars and I'll close the uh, subcutaneous incisions with uh, just a, a foro monocryl. Um, again, because I use a step trocar, the sub xiphoid location, I just, again, close that with the subcuticular. I don't go back and, and close the um, uh, the fascial incision. Now these wires have lots of length to them and you're not gonna pull the whole wire through. You're gonna have lots of extra length. And so I usually pull out about, I don't know, probably about four centimeters of wire that's exiting the skin right here. And then I take the remaining excess wire and place it back through the fascia back into the abdomen. I'll then use a uh, 4 chromic and just secure each of these wires as they're exiting the skin, just to provide a little extra support until these wires scar in. So it, it makes it uh, less likely that somebody's gonna accidentally uh, tug on the wire. Um, once the wires are tunneled and the incisions are closed, we'll use a crimping device and we'll crimp little gold um, pins to the end of each wire. I don't uh, show that in this picture, but these are actually um, what the pins look like. These come in this black portion, which is known as the block. The pins then get inserted into the block. And again, we use a little special instrument that comes with the kit to insert the pins. It goes in a very specific um, orientation, uh, which we can show you at the time of implantation. But essentially, the left leads go first, followed by the right lead, and then the last lead is the ground lead. Um, we then uh, plug this into our actual pacer box. So, um, again, this is the clinical station, which will test all four leads. We also use the same clinical station to program the box, which then gets connected with this cable to the block uh, in which we test the, the system. So this is what the box looks like. Um, it's about the size of an old Walkman. I guess I'm, I'm showing my age a little bit, but it's the size of an old Walkman. It's got uh, two buttons on it. The only thing that you do on the box is turn it on and turn it off. There's no programming with the box. There are no um, adjustments that can be made without hooking it up to the clinical station. There's then a, a, a cable that attaches the pacer box um, to the block. And this brown patch is basically a big Band-Aid um, that has um, a connector that the block is secured to, and that just secures it to the skin so that the wires aren't dangling down. Um, so again, this is uh, what it looks like when, when all the incisions are closed. Um, we'll then test um, with the actual pacer box connected. So I'll ask the um, anesthesiologist to disconnect from the ventilator, or excuse me, disconnect from a, um, uh, from a rate on the ventilator and put them on a spontaneous mode. So typically I'll put them on say five of peak, 10 of pressure support, and then I'll uh, turn the pacer on and see what kind of tidal volumes we're getting. Usually I'm happy if we get around 300 to 350 cc tidal volumes. But again, you have to realize that these patients are still under general anesthesia. So it's, it's gonna be much lower than once the patient is awakened from their anesthesia. But usually I'm pretty satisfied if I can get 300 cc tidal volumes. So this is what the uh, kit looks like that the actual patient gets. So um, they always get two uh, pacer boxes, or what we call uh, EPGs, electric pulse generators. Um, they get uh, a box that contains several of the brown adapters, which connect uh, the pacer block to the uh, abdominal wall. They get two of the gray cables that connect the uh, pacer box to the block. And then they get uh, several batteries. Now, these uh, pacers are designed to operate off of C batteries. You can also use lithium ion batteries. Um, the advantage of the lithium ion batteries is that they will last longer. So they'll last about uh, three weeks of continuous use versus a regular C battery, which will last about 96 hours. 
The disadvantage is that the lithium ion batteries are more expensive. And because they're lithium ion, they can't be flown in a plane. So that um, delays delivery. So if they have to get delivered, they have to come by ground, which can take some time. Um, so these are the different pacer settings that we program with the um, uh, clinical workstation. So um, that's what I call the, the pacer box. And so I'm going to explain what e each of these means. So the first one, let me go back one slide. So the, the um, amplitude and pulse width are what we consider the, uh, the stimulator intensity. The intensity is the, the combination of these two, so the amplitude and pulse width. They must be sufficient to meet the threshold of excitability of the stimulated tissue, which in this case is the diaphragm. So the amplitude and pulse width are varied to control the, the area of contraction for the patient's knee. So as the amplitude and pulse width rise, the nerve fibers nearest the electrodes or largest in diameter are triggered, and uh, they meet this threshold, which then subsequently cause the nerves to, uh, to fire and the muscle to contract. And so as you increase the, the amplitude and pulse width, the nerve fibers further away um, get stimulated and get recruited, and you get more uh, protraction. But you must recognize that, that nerve firing is, is an all or none event. So once the, um, uh, the action potential is triggered, um, it's going to complete an entire uh, uh, action potential event. So all nerve fibers within range of the electrode are going to fire at the same time. Um, the the further away that you get, the more amplitude or pulse width that you need. So um, uh, typically, if you're talking about somebody with a high spinal cord injury, you can set these to close to the maximum range um, because they don't have sensation. But if you've got somebody that, that maybe is an incomplete quad and has some sensation, you may have to make some adjustments um, because they may complain of pain. And typically, if they're going to complain of pain, it's going to be in the shoulder and the neck because, again, the, the diaphragm doesn't have good uh, pain uh, fibers and you get what's called referred pain, and it's typically in the shoulder and neck. So that's amplitude and pulse width. When we talk about applying a stimulus or a single pulse um, uh, to the diaphragm, it, it produces a short-lived muscle twitch of, of typically not more than 200 microseconds. So that's what we're doing when we're trying to map the phrenic nerve. Um, if these pulses are repeated uh, more frequently than this 200 microseconds, uh, then the muscle fibers don't have time to relax um, in between stimuli. And eventually you get a continuous or tetanic or fused contraction. And that's really what we want. We want the whole diaphragm to contract at the same time. Um, and so uh, increasing the contraction strength can actually be obtained by um, increasing um, the pulse ramp, or excuse me, the pulse frequency um, to obtain this, this fused contraction. Um, but what we actually found out is that actually lower pulse frequencies convert the muscle fibers uh, more quickly back to that type one fiber. Um, and so it, it's really a fine line between um, applying just enough to get that, uh, that, that fused contraction and not so much that we're impeding that architectural change back to that type one muscle fiber that, that we're looking for. The pulse ramp, on the other hand, defines the number of pulses until the pulse intensity reaches the final programmed value. So basically, until we get to our final breath. And so the pulse ramp is adjusted to sort of smooth out the start of each inspiratory cycle. Um, so it modulates the pulse intensity at the onset of each uh, inspiration. So the combination of pulse ramp and pulse frequency determine the overall ramp time interval, so how long our, our overall breath is. So these are the maximum and minimum settings for each parameter. Uh, so just to give you an example of what I would do in somebody who has a high uh, C-spine injury, I'll set the amplitude to usually around 18 milliamps, the pulse width to 180 microseconds, the frequency to 18, respirations about 16 to 18, depending on what their settings were before they came into the operating room, an inspiratory time of 1.1 second and a, a ramp of 10. And this is just a starting point. Once I get the patient back to the ICU and I get them awakened from anesthesia, we'll start pacer trials. 
and then we'll make adjustments depending on what their tidal volume is, what their pain threshold is, um, and how their pulse ox, uh, ox uh, is doing and what their uh, capnography is showing. Um, so how do we know if there's a problem? So the um, image on the left, this is actually one of our old EPGs or pacer boxes. So at the top, it says RA4 and shows a one, two, three, four. Those are the four leads. One and two are the left-sided leads in the left hemidiaphragm, three and four are the right. The 15 BPM is the breaths per minute. So in this case, you set to 15 breaths. And the AAA just indicates that all of these leads are functioning appropriately. So on the old EPGs, they used to alternate either, they would show either A's, B's, uh, or X's if there was a malfunction. The newer EPGs will actually, instead of showing an A or B, they'll show a star. And that means that it's functioning appropriately. If you see an X, however, that means that one or all of the leads is malfunctioning. Um, so if you see that all four leads are showing an X, that usually means that there's a problem with the ground lead. Um, and it's usually this last lead right here usually becomes frayed and is broken, in which case we can actually cut it, place a new gold pin on the end of the wire and put that pin back into the block and that usually solves the issue. If you see an X on one of the individual leads, again, we'll do the same technique where we cut the lead, try to put a new pin on it and put it back in the block. If that doesn't uh, uh, resolve the issue, then we have to take them back to the OR and, and do a reimplantation. Now the repairs can be done at the bedside. They can be done in clinic. They're very easy to do. Uh, it's the same equipment that you use to, to implant initially. All right, so just to move through this last portion relatively quickly, because um, this is about the, the temporary system, uh, and I want to give everybody a chance to ask any questions that you may have. Um, but you may be asking why I chose Superman to COVID, um, and, and where did COVID come into play? Well, we know, um, looking at studies from hospitalized COVID patients, uh, that those patients that develop severe COVID infections, approximately 33% will develop ARDS, uh, of those, about 26% will require ICU admission. And of those, 16% um, will require prolonged mechanical, mechanical ventilatory support and even die. And so that's where the um, temporary trans airy system came in, into play. So in April of 2020, Synapse received emergency uh, FDA approval for uh, emergency use in COVID patients. The goal was to facilitate rapid weeding from, uh, from the vent and thereby increase uh, vent availability. Again, if you remember the beginning surges of COVID, there was lots of concerns that we didn't have enough uh, vents. And so this was, was to help with that. So the trans area system is a temporary um, percutaneous uh, diaphragmatic uh, stimulator, just like the, the permanent one. It's just purely percutaneous. It can be done open or laparoscopic. Um, there is no mapping involved. You just essentially place the leads where you um, expect the anterior and posterior branches and you pull those out percutaneously uh, through the abdominal wall. Um, it's uh, designed to rever reverse um, disuse atrophy and prevent that uh, ventilator induced uh, diaphragm dysfunction. Once a patient successfully um, extubated and no longer needing the system, you just pull the wires just like you would do with temporary cardiac pacers. Uh, this is what the system looks like. Unlike the permanent system, uh, we don't connect this to a separate clinical station or program. All the programming is done on the actual box. Um, these um, connect temporarily to the abdominal wall with these little electrode patches. And then you insert the uh, pacer leads into these um, blocks. And then the uh, settings can be adjusted on the fly. Again, unlike the permanent system, this system is designed to stay in for no longer than 30 days. Once that 30 days has passed, the system will no longer function. The battery dies and can't be restarted. Um, and so at that point, you would have to remove the system um, and consider implanting a permanent device if, if they still need pacing. Um, so that's the, the temporary system. I've got to be honest, I don't have a whole lot of experience with it. I've used it a handful of times, um, but it can be used in patients, not just COVID patients, but any patients that you suspect may have difficulty coming off the ventilator. If you've got somebody with an open admin, 
severe chest or abdominal trauma and you're worried that they may have difficulty, you can place this system. Um, so with that, I wanted to show you just an example of, of a patient that I implanted. This was a, a case of a, a guy that uh, dove into a shallow pond. He had a C high uh, C2 fracture dislocation. Um, he was an incomplete quad and he was on the ventilator. I implanted him and this is a video of him um, uh, being discharged from his rehab facility. You can see that he's totally off the ventilator. His trach is tapped. Um, and at the end, he's able to talk. Can you please smile? Like, you have some independence. You are independent right now. You can, you can take little... So that's an example of, of a really good outcome you can have. Now, what I didn't mention earlier is that if you have a patient who is, who is an acute quad, they're an acute high spinal cord injury, if you can get to those patients within, say, the first uh, 48 to 72 hours of injury, you can implant them and you could potentially even avoid needing to place a tracheostomy and directly extubate them once they're on the patient. So that is something to consider. Um, so in summary, I know that was a, a fairly quick talk. Again, I want to give everybody um, a, a chance to, to ask um, any questions they may have. But in summary, uh, diaphragm pacing helps patients come off the ventilator. It helps um, convert the uh, type 2B muscle fibers back to the type 1 slow oxidative fatigue resistant muscle. It's a very safe operation. Yeah, it's a laparoscopic, it's quick, it can be done in less than an hour. Um, I showed you a patient that already had a peg, but if I've got a patient that I know is going to need a peg and a trach at the same time, I'll do all three procedures of the same operation. So I'll, I'll implant my pacer, I'll tunnel my leads, then I'll go back in and I'll do a lap assisted um, peg. Um, New temporary pacers may decrease the need for prolonged mechanical uh, ventilatory support. So the new systems like the transary system, um, and ultimately we may avoid needing to do tracheostomies um, altogether. Um, and hopefully, um, as we start using this more and more, we may negate that ventilator-induced diaphragm dysfunction, and hopefully that'll become uh, something of a class.